Good evening and welcome to the Roselle Center for Healing's ongoing webinar series. My name is Dr. Harlan Browning and I'll be your presenter tonight talking about common problems of both the foot and ankle. Over the course of the evening, these are the topics that we'll cover. Specifically, we'll talk about the anatomy and mechanics of the foot and ankle proper. We'll review the essential, essentials of what I call quality gait. We'll touch on common adaptations to poor foot function, in other words, the ways that we change the way that we walk to accommodate for a bad foot or a bad ankle. We'll talk about primary problems that affect the foot and ankle. We'll touch on steps to assess the foot and the ankle. And lastly, and probably most importantly, we'll talk about conservative treatments to fix the problems and not just uh, take care of the symptoms. When we look at the foot and the ankle, it's important to know it's made up of a considerable amount of different bones, 26 to be in total. That's a quarter of all the bones in the body. It has 33 joints, 107 ligaments, 19 muscles, and three primary arches. So there's a lot of dynamic structures in the foot, which is extremely important to allow us to stand, to walk, and to move. This is what our normal foot anatomy should be composed of. This drawing here, I'm going to take a laser pointer, here is a lateral x-ray of a foot. Obviously this is the back part of the foot, this is the heel bone of the calcaneus, and these are the um, tarsal bones, these are the metatarsal bones, and these are what's called the phalanges or the toes. So this is a normal uh, foot anatomy. It's broken down into three sections for the sake of analyzing the mechanics and certainly things that go wrong with it. There's the rear part of the foot, we call it the rear foot. It's made up of the calcaneus and the talus. We have the midfoot, which is made up of uh, several bones, the navicular, the cuneiform, cuneiform here, and a cuboid bone. And then the forefoot, which is those metatarsals and phalanges. So when we look at this whole complex, it's quite dynamic, but from the underside, the important component is this. The foot actually forms a tripod when we stand. So in other words, when we are statically standing there, we should ideally put pressure on the heel, on the fifth metatarsal, and the first metatarsal. So this effect makes a tripod or a triangle. And we'll reference this as we go through tonight because typically people who have foot issues lose the ability to maintain this tripod or they start to distribute the weight from maybe here the fifth metatarsal onto these other metatarsals or maybe we don't even make contact here and we just make too much contact in the, in the rear foot or on the calcaneus. The foot is made up of several different arches, which gives us support or gives us a trussing effect of the foot. From front to back, we have a longitudinal arch. There's actually one on the inside called the medial longitudinal arch, and there would one, be one on the outside called the lateral longitudinal arch. This gives us that trussing or that open effect underneath of our foot. Conversely, we have a transverse arch that gives us a cupping effect on the bottom. So these arches are extremely important for us to be able to stand and more importantly distribute weight as we move through gait. As I touched on moving through gait a second ago, it really comes down to this. There's something called the windless effect of Hicks. There must have been a professor named Hicks and he figured out this whole mechanism, um, but it's important to understand the way it works because this is the way that we are efficient when we stand and we move. This is an illustration of the foot in a neutral position. Again, this is the heel bone or the calcaneus. This is the front of the foot. So this is, remember again, the rear foot. This is the midfoot and the forefoot. As you can see on the bottom is something called the plantar fascia. And we've heard of that because some people get plantar fasciitis. But the importance of the, the plantar fascia is more about the ability for us to generate force than it is actually to hold us up. So in the static position, we can see that trussing effect, okay? So we see those longitudinal arches give us this truss. Well, that truss is good because it dissipates our body weight. So our leg bones go up here and our body is here. So as we put weight down through our body, it's dissipated equally from the heel 
to the forefoot. And our plantar fascia helps to, to modulate that and distribute it equally. As we start to walk and we lift our heel off and then we, we start to push off on our toe, this is where the windlass effect takes place. The great toe must be able to extend or go up because as it extends, it pulls on the plantar fascia, which causes the truss, okay, remember that these longitudinal arches to be pulled up and provide for a rigid platform for us to propel ourselves forward. So we'll re refer to this as we go through tonight because in many cases of foot dysfunction or ankle dysfunction, people start to lose this, this trussing and this windless effect. So we will certainly touch upon this um, as we continue. All right, if we're gonna put force on our heel and eventually put it on our, our toe, we have to go through a, a series of motions to allow that to happen. And this is what we call rockers. In other words, we're gonna actually physically rock on different parts of our foot as we go through gait. Here on the left, the first thing that happens is when we hit with our heel, okay, so you can see this is the leg bone, the person is heel striking here and moving forward Okay, on the heel, that's called the heel rocker. So the heel allows us to propel forward the leg bone to, to move uh, in a forward direction to put weight on the foot itself. As that happens, we displace the rocker or the motion to more of the midfoot, okay? And now we call this the ankle rocker. So as you move through, your ankle physically travels forward into something that we call dorsiflexion. And we're going to touch on the, the fact that dorsiflexion or the lack thereof is a big problem with people who develop foot and ankle problems. So as this person continues to pr progress through, they've gone through this ankle rocker, they're, they're dorsiflexing through. At a certain point, the ankle mortar, so the ankle joint, doesn't allow us to move any further on our ankle. So the heel actually begins to lift. So we start to rock on the very front part or the forefoot on the beginning of the metatarsals and starting to go onto our toes. And lastly, we start to get to a place to where we're putting pressure on the big toe and that's the windless effect. It extends or should extend and that allows us to lift this foot up and carry it through to the next step. So this is the process that takes place over and over on both feet. Almost all folks that have foot mechanic problems have dysfunction in one of these stages. Sometimes they have them in multiple stages. But when you see this process, you can uh, get a better understanding of why you'll start to develop problems, be it in the heel itself, maybe the ankle, maybe the metatarsals, or possibly even in the great toe. Well, we can't look at the effects of gait just as something that's involving the foot itself. It involves the whole body. And certainly we're gonna start with the foot. And the most important thing that I think of, of a foot is it needs to be supple when it's not in contact with the ground. In other words, the, the foot needs to be very mobile so when it actually hits the ground, it's in a good position to actually become rigid so we can start to decelerate our body and start to transform forces to propel us forward. In order for that to happen, and like we talked about before, when we get to that ankle rocker, it's essential that we can get at least 90 degrees, if not more, of dorsiflexion. So one of the first things that I'm going to look at a person um, that has a foot or ankle problem, or to be honest with you, you know, any problems from the ankle up, I'm going to see how much dorsiflexion they have or they don't have. In many cases, people have too little dorsiflexion, which extremely compromises the ability for us to move forward on that leg. Again, the next step, the windless effect of Hicks, does the big toe actually extend? Is that toe arthritic or is it rigid? If it is, then it's not gonna allow us to extend on the toe, then it makes it very hard for us to lift the arch. Remember, the plantar fascia lifts the arch and ultimately it makes it difficult for us to propel off of the big toe itself. As that's happening and we step through, 
we have to have extension in the hip. So as this person lands on their heel and progresses through, okay, then the leg is eventually going to come up like this. So this leg is going into extension. The hip is physically extending. So if a person has dysfunction in their hip, be it maybe arthritis or they just have really tight muscles, they can't extend their hip, which is going to greatly compromise their gait. If we take that further forward, then the pelvis will become oblique in many cases. In other words, we can't extend the hip. We're going to do things subtly to compromise, and that's almost always going to involve shifting the pelvis because the pelvis makes up half of the hip joint. The femur sits up in the pelvis, so if we can't extend at the hip, we're going to do things at, at the pelvis or the ilium to, to compromise to make it possible for us to do that motion. So it's, it's, it's bad form, but that's the way the body works. We're going to keep on trying to move whatever it takes. And lastly, maybe the person's issues with their gait has nothing to do with from here down. Maybe it has to do with their ability to swing their arms. When we walk and we go through gait, it's called a cross crawl pattern. If I lift and swing my right leg through when I walk, my left arm is going to go in the same direction. That's going to give me the ability to counterbalance. So for people who do not have good arm swing because maybe they've had previous shoulder injuries or they just have tightness in the muscles, my swing is going to become less. If I swing my arm less and my leg bone still moves in the same trajectory, I'm going to be off balance. So what happens over time with a shoulder restriction or upper arm restriction is as my arm moves less, then I'm going to start swinging my leg less because I don't want to be off balance. Let's get into what I call the terrible two of foot problems. And for the most part, people fall into this category. They are what's called overpronated which means more or less that they have a flat foot. So when a, flat, a foot becomes flat, it caves inwards. Well, in order for it to cave inwards, we're going to get distortion of both the calcaneus, that's the heel bone, and ultimately the two bones above it, the tibia and the fibula, will go in an opposite direction. So as you can see from this angulation here and this angulation here, a lot of stress is placed through the ankle joint itself. Well, because the pronation actually takes place at the bottom of the foot, we're going to see the plantar fascia become excessively stretched at the same time. So this type of foot mechanics can cause anything and everything from the bottom of the foot up. I would probably say that 80 to 90 percent of the people that have a foot mechanics problem present with the pronation, but in some cases, maybe 10%, maybe 5%, the person is what we call over supinated. Instead of their foot collapsing down too much, they're literally walking on the outside of their foot, walk, walking on their fifth and their fourth toe. Well, when that happens, the inside of the, the foot does not make good contact. Certainly the big toe that's out here doesn't make good contact. And similar to the pronation where we get the distortion in the ankle, we get a different presentation. Okay? The end product is, is kind of similar. We put a lot of stress through the ankle joint itself and we put it through the heel. This person is not as typical. This person is uh, somebody who's always had rigid feet. Usually uh, you see it as, as, a, as a minor and their foot just doesn't develop in the right way as they get older. Well, if we have this pronation and we have this supination problem, what does that look like on the bottom of our foot or when we walk? So imagine yourself on the beach and when you're walking, you can see the way your footprint looks. Well, in many cases, or I should say in ideal cases, we want to have a mild pronation. So pronation is actually good. We just don't want too much and we don't want too little. Pronation allows the foot to decelerate, absorb forces, but if it stays collapsed for too long, it slows down our progress and puts too much stress through the bottom of the foot. So this person has what we would call a normal arch or they have actually had mild pronation. So you can actually see, see their heel, okay? This is their, their fifth toe 
and this is their first toe. So remember the tripod? So here's our tripod. We go here, we go here and here. So that's a nice little tripod. For the person that has over pronation, and again, that's the majority of folks, we can see that the arch is very collapsed. Okay, everything is very pronounced. The tissue, as you can tell, is very stretched out. The tripod is still there, but the issue becomes the softer connective tissue that goes between here becomes extremely taut and under too much stress. Conversely, the person who has a supinated foot or what we could refer to as an under pronated foot still again has the tripod, okay, but the amount of contact that the foot makes actually with the ground is too little. So the, their ability to dissipate their body weight and effectively move through the gravitational field becomes compromised. So they're putting a tons of pressure walking on the outside of the foot. When we talk later about actually measuring your, your pronation or supination by using a gait analysis machine, what you'll often see with this person is you won't even see some of these toes make contact. You'll just see big toe, you'll see a little bit of these metatarsals, and you'll see the heel. So um, the amount of pronation and the amount of supination directly impacts how much activity and how much of the body actually uh, progresses through and lands on the, on the, the forefoot and ultimately through the toes. So let, let's say we have pronation or let's say we have supination or what we have arthritis or we have a bad big toe or whatever. We're going to have to come up with some adaptations to allow us to continue to walk. And for most people that have foot mechanic problems or hip mechanic problems that affect the foot, um, pain is typically not the first thing that develops. There's an adaptation. And because the body is good at adapting, we can go through extremely long periods of time and not know that we have um, some sort of underlying mechanical issue. But typically, these are four of the most common things that, that the body will do to make walking easier when we don't have the capacity to do it in a normal fashion. So the first thing that we'll often see is the person will try to either rotate their foot or their leg inward or outward to compensate for the lack of maybe mobility here or the overpronation or oversupination. Okay, so we rotate it inwards and out to outwards. If you look at a person when they walk, ideally both feet should be pointed directly forward. So if we see one foot that's cocked out and the other one is not, that's kind of an indication that there's an adaptation that's taking place to either compensate for a foot mechanics problem or a hip problem. Regardless, if it's not equal side to side, we're going to get these compensatory problems that will get ingrained over time and ultimately fatigue and stress the tissue and, and usually ends up causing some of the, the, the problems that we're going to talk about later. The second strategy that people will do to compensate for poor foot or um, lower leg mechanics is instead of them heel striking, remember we hit the heel, we go flat on the foot and then we toe off. Instead of them doing all three of those important things, they will hit with their heel, go into their, their midfoot and immediately lift their heel up off the ground because they don't have the ability to, to translate forward. So that could be maybe the ankle is restricted, maybe the great toe is uh, restricted. So it uh, early heel lift is definitely an indication that we have a mechanical problem almost always somewhere down through here. The rotating the foot in and out could be anywhere along the way. The lifting the heel early very often is down through here. The next thing that we see is the person will often try to hyperextend their knee instead of walking through their step. So when we hit the heel strike and we go flat on the foot, as we go forward, if we can't go off our toe, then we do this. We'll start to buckle the heel, or I'm sorry, the, the knee backwards to allow us to compensate for the fact that we can't go through dorsiflexion. So hyperextending the knees, you'll see that a lot with little kids. You'll see it even when they're standing there, their, their knees are hyperextended backwards. That's a classic sign of, of an adaptation or a muscle weakness pattern that hasn't been addressed. And certainly we talked about this. People who have ankle uh, and foot problems 
will try to compensate by even um, presenting more pronation or supination. So they have pronation, supination, and they actually make it worse because they have to do that in order to walk through their gait. So let's talk about the global effect of what I call pronation. So when we think of pronation, we, we most of the time we just talk about the foot, which which makes sense. However, for some people, their pronation doesn't cause really much of any issue in the foot or the ankle. It causes problems upstream from it. So if we start down here and we look at this person's pronation, okay, their foot is collapsing inwards, okay? As the foot collapses inwards, these two bones, the tibia and the fibula, will want to rotate inwards. So this inward rotation now starts to put stress on the knee. So we get a misalignment of the knee. In order to allow us to do that, then the femur physically starts to rotate inwards. And now we get a misalignment in the hip. So the pronation of the foot causes the misalignment through the ankle joint can probably cause it through the knee joint and probably can cause it through the, gyp, the hip joint or all of those um, combined. So for folks that have unresolved hip issues, the first thing I'm always going to look at is do they have pronation on that side of the body? Many times they do. So their pronation is causing so much stress through their hip joint and you can call it a bursitis or a tendonitis, you can call it impingement syndrome or, or what have you. The symptom is the tension and irritation inflammation in the hip. The problem is the overpronation in the foot. So these are the people that will often go through different forms of therapies and treatments. The hip will feel better when they're actively getting treated. And then when they're done with their treatment, over time, the problem comes back. The problem returns because the hip is still not stable due to the overpronation. And from here, in this illustration, you can kind of see from front to back really how it affects the whole body. Okay, this person has the pro overpronation, so it's, it's putting a lot of torque through the foot and the ankle. Here they're getting the knee, it's knocking inwards. It's affecting the hip. So as it affects the hip, guess what? The pelvis starts to drop. So the pelvis becomes ob oblique. And you can see it here. This pelvis becomes oblique and the spine becomes kind of turned to the side. Well, ultimately, if the spine turns to the side, it's going to affect our shoulder girdle and possibly our neck. So long-standing pronation problems can work their way up this whole kinematic chain to eventually cause problems here. So for folks that have unresolved neck and shoulder problems, again, the overpronation is something that you might want to consider. So the takeaway from all of this, and certainly from this slide, is when we think of flat feet, we definitely think of foot and ankle problems, but we're going to also think about things above it. In applied kinesiology, one of the specialties that we use in the office, we often will talk about this triangle. It's called the triad of health. And the triad of health looks at certain entities that change our physical being. Classically, we talk about structural issues of the body. Well, that makes sense. We slip and fall. We have a motor vehicle accident. That changes the way that we work. Well, in some cases, our problem may be chemically mediated. Maybe there's an inflammatory situation that's causing our ache and pain. Maybe it's because our diet is poor. Maybe because we're, we're dehydrated. So chemistry becomes important when we look at a, a problem. And certainly, these are things that I consider when I see a person that has foot or ankle issues. And we, we, we can't forget this. There's a neurological component of, of the body and an emotional component of the body that has a lot to do with it as well. So if the nerves that are going to the structures, the foot, the ankle, the leg, are compromised, they're not working well, then we're often going to see changes to wherever those nerves go to. But for today's topic, we're really going to concentrate on these two guys, the structural and neurological, okay? But at the end, I'm going to touch a little bit on the chemical side as far as what we can do to reduce the inflammation that's associated with these neurological issues in the foot and the ankle and the structural as well.
All right, so let's get into the most classic foot and ankle problems that people deal with um, with day-to-day -day life. There's certainly more than, than what I've put on here, but I think I've picked out some of the, the most common ones that people see. It's fair game for people to have multiple issues with their foot, so it becomes important to be able to tease out different symptom patterns and different wear and tear patterns on the foot to be able to identify where the underlying issue is. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is something called plantar fasciitis, and most people have heard of this. In this illustration right here, this is obviously a person's uh, uh, tibia. This is their heel bone, and again, this is this is their forefoot. And remember, we talked about this. The, here's the plantar fascia, and again, the plantar fascia is essential because it provides what? This trussing effect or this arch. Fascia is a connective tissue that envelops all of our muscles in our body and it connects us to, to bones, to ligaments, tendons, and organs. So it's, it's an all-encompassing structure that goes throughout the whole body. And the plantar fascia is one of the most dense fascial structures that we see anywhere from the top to the bottom in the body. And it's extremely resilient. But like any other tissue, it can only take so much abuse before it causes um, you know, aches and pains. So plantar fasciitis is a painful inflammatory process of that fascia connective tissue on the bottom of the foot. It most commonly develops due to either a loss of arch over time or because we have too much domination of the calf muscle in the back, that's the gastrocnemius, okay, in lieu of weakness in the muscles in the front, um, that just don't do much at all. So too much domination here, the fascia attaches to the back of the, the gastrocnemius and it just gets chronically pulled, okay? The classic pattern is that the arch will often start to be lost over a period of time. And as it loses, then the plantar fascia becomes stretched more and more and more. And as it does, wherever it attaches, okay, so we see the bottom of the foot, we most of the time we'll see it here on the back posterior part of the plantar fascia where it meets the calcaneus. Um, then we'll kind of see it here on the medial aspect along the big, where the back of the big toe is. And again, here on the outer aspect. So any part back through here is common. Certainly we can get it up through here as well. Um, so it's any inflammation throughout the whole length of the plantar fascia. And the classic sign that we see is this is the person that says the pain is first uh, worst upon first weight bearing in the morning and they do a couple of steps and it and it kind of eases up over time. As the plantar fascia stays in flame though, it can lead to what we call a heel spur and we're going to look at that one right now. So a heel spur is nothing more than new bone formation where the tissue is pulling too aggressively where it attaches. And we see it most commonly in two areas. One, on the bottom of the foot, and you can see where the plantar fascia attached here, it's pulled so much that this person has a little hook there, okay? Well, it, it, you know, it makes sense if we have a little hook there, every time we step down, that hook is gonna poke into the tissue. So it's a tractioning that's taking place, causing the spur as it irritates the bone, the bone forms a callus, and that callus actually turns into hard bony structure. So when we take an x-ray, you can physically see a heel spur, where if a person just has plantar fasciitis, nothing is really going to show up on an x-ray, but if we let it progress, there's a possibility we can get the heel spur. Um, conversely, we can also see those spurs happen where the calf muscle itself, the calf is up here, that's that gastrocnemius, goes into the Achilles tendon where it attaches to the back superior part of the calcaneus. It's pulling so aggressively that it causes new calcification here. And this is the type of person that actually can feel a knot in their Achilles tendon. That knotting is a combination of the inflammation in the soft tissue. And in many situations, it's the bone that's starting to form there. The most common causes of this is carrying too much weight, obesity. You carry a lot of weight, you're putting a lot of force through the gastrocnemius, you're putting a lot of force through, remember, the plantar fascia, and ultimately attractions these areas and causes this, this, the spurs. 
the flat feet phenomenon, and this is a biggie, high heeled shoes. So the, the higher the heel on the shoe, the more it's going to shorten your calf muscle, which is going to cause much more tractioning through here. So for the ladies who like to wear the high heels, um, that's a no-no because not only is it going to contribute to the, the likelihood of getting these heel spurs, be it on the bottom of the foot or on, on the top of the calcaneus, but most, most high heel shoes cause constriction of the toes in the front. And we're going to touch a little bit later on what happens when you strangulate or you squeeze those toes in. So take home message, high heels, be careful, nothing more than an inch. And certainly when you don't need to wear them, don't. We want to be in a relatively flat shoe that's as close to neutral. Okay, we want we don't want a big heel. Let's move forward in the foot now and let's talk about what happens in the toes. And there's two scenarios that are fairly common that we see. One is something called a hammer toe and the other is something that we call a claw toe. So a hammer toe is a deformity of the proximal or the closer part of the interphalangeal joint, this guy here, okay? So what happens is the hammer toe causes it to drop down, okay? It's like, it's like the head of a hammer. So the toe goes up and it bends down. As you can tell, it puts a tremendous amount of strain on what's called a, the pip joint. This is the proximal interphalangeal joint. Well, this is no different than your knee or your hip. The more strain that we put through this, the greater likelihood that that joint is to break down. The cartilage wears down. As it wears down, we can get arthritis. So this is the hammer toe, okay? The claw toe, although it kind of looks the same, really involves the distal part. So that proximal part, it's it's still going to drop down, but you know what? It continues all the way down, and there's your claw. So it almost looks like an animal, right? So the whole toe becomes de deformed down. The interesting thing, most of the, t the reasons behind this is because of a poorly fitting or narrow toe box shoe. So I'm going to touch on this over and over again. If the shoe doesn't fit well and really important if the toe box is too narrow the likelihood that you start to develop these types of deformities is going to be greater as time goes by the next few slides are going to touch on other situations that are directly tied into the toe box so if you have a pair of shoes and you can see a callus on your outside of your little toe or the outside of your big toe that's an early indicator that that toe box is too narrow for you. So you need to make sure when you buy a pair of shoes that you get fitted properly and you're not just buying a pair of shoes because they look good or because you read a review. Shoes are designed for different people. So you want to make sure we get you into a shoe that is properly fitted. I added this here because um, this is an entity that we don't talk enough about with foot problems. The claw toe can often be caused due to a nerve compression. And we refer to this as tarsal tunnel syndrome. I think most people have heard of something called carpal tunnel syndrome, and that's a compression of a nerve called the median nerve in our wrist because of overuse or maybe constricture. Well, the same thing can happen in the foot when we put too much pressure in the tarsal tunnel, which is more or less where the ankle the rear foot meets the midfoot, then we can pinch these nerves that go to these muscles, okay? And if we pinch the nerve that goes to the muscle, then the muscle becomes weak. And if the muscle's job is to pull this part of the toe down and it can't do it, guess what? It's gonna relax. So the toe is going to go up here and it's gonna continue to go down here. So tarsal tunnel. That's a big one. So if you're starting to develop the, the claw toe uh, version or sometimes the hammer toe, we need to assess to make sure that this is not a nerve compression issue um, as well as a shoe issue. In some situations, people develop arthritis in the foot. 
And the most common reason that we develop arthritis in the foot is because the, the foot is not maintaining good integrity. So we're displacing force into parts of the foot and overwhelming its capacity. And when that happens, for the most part, we get something called osteoarthritis. That's old school arthritis. That's the one we think about. So this is really a non-inflammatory degenerative disease, meaning it's not caused because the body is producing all these inflammatory mediators. It's happening because we're overusing the joint, okay? We classically see that with an injury. So if we've injured the foot, um, I put down advanced aging. You'll classically see it as we get older. And again, it goes back to poor fitting shoes. If the shoe doesn't fit well and it constricts the way that the foot moves and we're putting too much force through the, the joint itself, the joint will break down. Osteoarthritis, for the most part, will affect more than one joint. So when we take an x-ray of a person's foot, we will often see it. In this case, you can see this person has a little bit of arthritis here, has a little bit there, has a little bit through here. So we, we see it in multiple spots where when we talk about other types of arthritis, inflammatory arthritic conditions, gout being one of them. So we've we've all heard of gout. This is a situation where the body is producing inf inflammatory mediators. I chose gout because it's extremely common nowadays. If it wasn't common, you would not see advertisements on TV trying to sell you drugs to treat your gout. So it becomes more common. So inflammatory arthritic conditions like gout cause the joint to actually become deteriorated. Okay? It usually affects the big toe. What, what happens is we, we convert too much of our protein to, proteins into something called uric acid. Uric acid, like it sounds, is an acid. It's very caustic to the body, and it has a tendency to go to these joint spaces like the great toe. Each time we have a gout flare-up, okay, there is a likelihood that it actually destroys the connective tissue and the cartilage, okay? So for you folks that get on again, off again, gout flares, you've got to take a closer look at that. And almost always it relates to a dietary issue or a lifestyle issue. You're eating foods that are too inflammatory in nature and you're converting them over to uric acid. So take a close look at the diet, okay? If you have on again, off again foot pain when you get your annual blood work, I would strongly suggest that you check for uric acid. There's a lot of people who walk around with silent gout, meaning that their uric acid level is always high um, and they don't even know it. So again, inflammatory conditions will destroy the joint and just kind of obliterate it, where arthritic, uh, osteoarthritic ones will cause new bone formation to happen. So staying in the front part of the foot, we also will want to consider the metatarsal. So these are our, our phalanges, are our toes, and the toes meet at what's called a metatarsal. Okay, here's a better illustration. These are our metatarsals. Okay, here's our phalanges, our toes, and the metatarsals articulate with um, these navicular bones and the, and the cuboid bone and all these guys back here. What can happen is these metatarsals can physically drop down. So in this picture, you can see this person looks like their second metatarsal has dropped, okay? And as it drops, it causes excessive uh, pressure on that area. So the, 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 the symptom pattern is you get this painful condition of the heads of the metatarsal. It's most commonly seen here in the second metatarsal, but it could be seen here in the, in the third as well, but we classically see it in the second. And what it'll also accompany is you'll often find that the person will get elevation of the toes that are around it. So as this metatarsal drops down, look at this, the big toe goes up. Well, this mechanism not only makes the, the big toe have extra strain, it puts more pressure on the metatarsal head it, it, itself, okay? The first indicator almost exclusively is the person forms a callus. So if you're getting these weird callus formation on the bottom of your foot, you probably either A, have a drop metatarsal, or B, you're, you walk prematurely on those metatarsals itself. In other words, you're changing your gait and you're putting too much pressure on them. So again, it comes back to what? 
most commonly seen in poor fitting shoes and flat feet. So there is a, there is a overlapping theme that I think you guys are seeing here. It's bad shoes and possibly f flat feet. Well, if we have bad shoes, what can it do the, to the big toe? Well, it can cause a bunion deformity, and we call that hallux valgus. Valgus just means it goes inward, okay? A bunion or hallux valgus is a deformity characterized by this deviation, outward deviation like this, while the great toe moves inwards. At first, this bump can just be inflammation of the soft tissue, but if you give it enough time, then we can develop arthritis through here, okay? The issue with the arthritic change is it affects the way the great toe moves. So going way back to when we started, if we can't extend the big toe because it's arthritic, that's one of my big four no-nos, then we're gonna have problem, problems because we can't propel ourselves. So that windless effect of Hicks becomes sabotage because the great toe doesn't move, okay? Um, symptomatically, the bunions will cause pain with, with standing and walking. And ultimately, if left alone and gets worse enough, this big toe will go in enough that it'll start to encroach on the second and third toes. For, for those people that have bunions, take your shoe off now. If you see the big toe jumping over the second toe or the second toe jumping over the third toe, you're more or less running out of room. In other words, the big toe is encroaching on the other ones. It goes back to what I said before. Almost always it's because of poor foot mechanics, loss of the arch, or poor fitting shoes, or the double whammy being both of them. We talked about the triad of health, and we talked about the structural things that'll affect us, the, the chemical, the inflammatory things like gout that'll affect us. And now we're gonna talk about one of the, the classic nerve um, issues that will affect us. It's something referred to as a neuroma, okay? On the bottom of your foot is a series of nerves called the inner digital nerves. And they go between each of our toes because they go down and they communicate with the muscles and the skin and the bones. Um, these nerves pass through conduits that should be relatively open. And when we start to compress or compromise their exit, then we run the likelihood of irritating them. So a neuroma is nothing more than inflammation and with enough time, formation of fibrous tissue surrounding these nerves. So as we pinch the nerve and the nerve gets inflamed, the body's gonna try to protect it by forming a callus around it. Well, that's what the neuroma is. The issue with the neuroma is it takes up space. Well, if we already don't have enough space to begin with, and now we get a neuroma in here, this is when the person goes from having periodic pain in the, in the front part of the foot to now we have pain all the time. And we classically see it between the second, third, fourth, and the fifth metatarsal. So we classically see it out through here. And it, it typically will present with pain and maybe numbness on weight bearing. So this is a scenario that can greatly mimic that um, metatarsalgia because it's at the it's at the end place. So Morton's neuromas and metatarsalgia can mimic each other. So it's really important that you ferret out the two of them. The differentiating factor for a neuroma versus the, versus, um, the drop metatarsal is when you squeeze the forefoot, you squeeze the front part of your foot. If it's a neuroma, that's gonna cause pain. Where if it's a drop metatarsal, typically won't cause irritation. On the flip side, when we have the drop metatarsal, if I push on the bottom of that foot where that metatarsal is, it typically causes pain there, but it doesn't affect the neuroma as much. So again, squeezing the, the forefoot almost always means, uh, means that it's a neuroma for, formation. Like I said, through all these slides, these are byproducts of poor shoes and poor foot mechanics. All of these are what we call overuse injuries. So. These slides that I'm presenting today are really no different than the slides I would present for a person who had shoulder problems. The tendonitis and the bursitis, those are all called overuse injuries. In other words, we're using the structure beyond its capacity 
it ultimately fails. And as it fails, bad stuff happens. We get inflammation, we get new bone formation, we upset nerves, and we end up certainly with compensated gait that can contribute to cause this problem and lead to many others. I put this this slide in as well because I see more and more people with true what we call neuropathies. So a neuropathy means that the nerve itself is becoming inflamed. Now, classically we think of neuropathy neuropathies as it relates to diabetes. So when a person has elevated blood sugar, that elevated sugar need, needs to go somewhere. And if it can't go into this, the muscle cells and it can't go into our liver, it's going to deposit itself in either our eyes or our kidneys or possibly the nerves itself. So as the, the blood sugar starts to gunk up our nerves, it affects the way that the nerves activate and fire, which can cause the nerves to be triggered and to cause chronic um, irritation in the area. So Diabetic neuropathy is a real phenomenon for many people, but there's other reasons that we see the same type of presentation. For some folks, it's lack of blood supply. So in other words, if they have poor blood supply in their foot because they have a lot of varicose veins or they've, um, they've, they've broken their le leg in the past and the vascular system is not good, as we start to reduce the blood supply to the tissue, then the tissue becomes starved and it becomes starved, it becomes inflamed. So the vascular supply becomes extremely important as it applies to people who have pain in the foot itself. What about things that can mimic this? And I think this is an important one for a lot of folks that have unresolved, quote unquote, diabetic or vascular neuropathy, despite the fact that they get their blood sugar under control or they improve their, their blood supply. Their neuropathy may be a mimic of a nerve compression somewhere above the foot itself. So, so for example, in the low back, if we put compression on the L5 nerve root, well, that nerve root goes all the way to the foot and it can refer pain there. So the referral of pain might feel like a neuropathy. So this might be the person who's been treated on and off for, again, diabetic or vascular neuropathy, and it just doesn't seem to be getting better. Well, the issue may be upstream. So we need to look at, is there compression of, of the nerve as it exits the, the, the spine? It's possible as well that as that nerve comes out from the spine and, and it goes through this tortuous course down through the hip and through the leg and through the knee, that it can be entrapped there as well as the ankle. Remember I talked about the tarsal tunnel, that nerve can get entrapped. So it can, it can mimic a neuropathy. So I included those two specifically for those folks that um, have been treated for neuropathy and it's not getting better, your best bet at that point is to start to look for other causes that mimic it. And again, nerve root comp compression, either be it in the back or somewhere down below it, is certainly something that needs to be investigated. Okay, so let's talk about the essentials in diagnosing the condition. We brought up a lot of different things that can happen in the foot and the ankle. Well, how do, how do we come up with a good diagnosis, which is essential to come up with a, a good treatment plan? First thing is, what's the history of problem? Was there trauma? Is it an acute problem? In other words, it's only been around for a week or two, or is it chronic? You've had it for long periods of time. Is the problem in one foot or one ankle, or is it in both? Are there things that can provoke it, make it worse, and are there things that can make it feel better? When you go to your doctor, whoever that, that may be, is their physical exam, which hopefully they do, the orthopedic exam, which hopefully they do, and a neurological exam, which hopefully they do, are those normal, okay? Because if they're not normal, that gives us an indication where the, the, the problem may be coming from. Did somebody assess the way that you move and the way you're balanced, you balance yourself. Does your gait deviate from one side to the other? Are you showing changes in gait? And in, in some cases, does special testing like an x-ray or a laboratory give us more information to, to help us rule in or rule out things like bone spurs and arthritis, or maybe one of those inflammatory types of things like gout itself?
So here are some of the steps that I look at to assess the foot. The first thing that I always look at is hopefully the person brings in a pair of shoes that they typically wear. So on, on this side is we see shoe wear patterns. So what does the bottom of the shoe look like? Is the heel worn more on one side versus the other? Is it is it worn more in the front? Is there in the sneaker, can you see where the toes are trying to push out of the side of the shoe? So shoe wear patterns give you a tremendous amount of information on what the foot has been doing. So when you go to your doctor, bring a pair of your shoes that you typically wear because he or she can look at that and kind of reverse engineer the situation. What is the posture tell us again we you know in early on in the presentation i talked about how the pronation causes the foot to collapse which causes the the, the tibia to rotate in and all these things to take place so what does their pa posture look like when they're standing from front to back and from side to side it gives us an idea of what what the person is doing to compensate for their problem and it certainly tells us how they're adapting over time now I referenced proper in-office testing. So you need to have your nervous system testing. Is the sensation along your foot equal on the inside as it is the outside? Is it the same from right to left? If it's not, that tells us there's probably a nerve involved. Is there weakness of the muscles that physically support the foot and ankle? If five out of the six muscles that I test are strong and one is weak, well, that's an indication that we have some sort of muscle imbalance there. Well, like we talked about, the foot likes to have support from front to back and side to side and, and from top to bottom. So when we have one muscle group that's weak, typically it's going to cause our gait to be modified and over time it's going to cause excessive force to be placed through the foot. So checking the muscle strength. If your doctor is not actually physically checking the muscles of your foot, your knee and your hip, then we're missing the boat. So check those, please. Do the bones in your foot move independently of each other? I think on the second or third slide, I said that one of the most important things that the foot can do is move from being supple. In other words, it's highly mobile when it's not in contact to the ground and as soon as it hits, it becomes rigid. Well, we can assess that by looking at the mobility of these bones. If these bones are becoming very rigid, then you're doing a really poor job of dissipating your forces, and certainly you're not gonna do a good job propelling you forward. So we always wanna look at the mobility in the foot. And again, don't forget, we might wanna go up to the knee, the um, the hip, the pelvis, all, all the way up, because it's a, it's a big kinematic chain. Does the person have good balance on that foot that gives them a problem? Yes or no? If they don't, that's an indication. And how do they move? Okay, we're going to look at their gait pattern. There's different types of movement screens. We're going to assess that dorsiflexion. Can that person move over top of their foot? Can their ankle actually move forward? If they can't, if it can't, that's not good. If the great toe can't extend, that's not good. So movement screens, very important. If we want to put this all together and really get a good understanding of the way a person walks, then there's extremely cool technology that allows us to do that. And there's different forms of gait assessment that deal with what we call a force plate. This is a force plate. So what the force plate allows us to do is to physically see how the person's foot goes through their whole transition of gait. And when we do that, it gives us indicators of pressure where it's put and it gives us an indication of how their line of drive and their equilibrium moves. So the days of making orthotics by putting your foot in a, in a foam cast or having the doctor have you sit on the end of the table and just hold your foot into place while they kind of make a form, those days have gone long by. And the reason being is it's extremely tough for the doctor to readily reproduce the same effect over and over again because it's extremely subjective getting the, the foot into a neutral position. So these new um, gait assessment tools are extremely valuable in allowing us to see where your deficiencies are. So I use these over and over again. 
what does the person look like when they're actually standing static? We take a we take a picture of that with this, and then certainly as we move through, it tells us a lot. It tells us how much force each toe is displaced, and it gives us hot spots to remember to assess that tripod. So we we want to see the, the hot spots here and here and here. So this person, as you can tell, isn't doesn't really have a good tripod. So gait assessment when you get it done, you want to get it done through somebody that uses a force plate. So let's talk about the keys to your success. How do we pull all these things together? Because we talked a lot of, about different types of causations, different types of pain patterns, different types of pathologies. Well, the first thing that we, we need to do is we need to maximize your structure. Almost all foot and ankle problems have a lot to do with a lack of structural integrity. Yes, we talked about the inflammatory ones like gout, Again, those are more of the five percenters, okay, or the rheumatoid arthritis. Those are the five or ten percenters. So most of the folks who are listening tonight are more on the structural side or the lack there of good structure. So the things that we need to run through, if we don't have good mobility in a joint that's designed to move, we have to restore the mobility. That's the way we're designed. If the shocks in our car don't work, we need new shocks. If, if the joints in our body don't absorb shock, we need to get them to move better. So assess the joint mobility integrity. We need to look at muscle balance. Do we have a good uh, give and take between strength and length? Okay. In other words, are the muscles strong and do they have good length or do we have weakness and we have too much shortness. We have to have somewhere in between. So if we have weakness in muscle groups, we need to figure out ways to improve that. And if we have shortening other muscle groups or tissues or fascia, we need to lengthen those. So we need somewhere between the strength and the, the strengthening and the stretching. If over time we start to develop any kind of scar tissue or adhesion formation, then that's going to retard the ability for that tissue to do what it needs to do. So we need to re remove or at least resolve as much of that scar tissue adhesion formation to make that joint better at what it does. That way, we can start to retrain the gait. So some people just don't know how to walk because their gait has been off for so long because they're compensating for a foot problem or a knee problem or a hip problem. So they change their gait, which only compounds their ability to walk and ultimately their balance. So do we have balance issues and gait problems? If we do, we need to retrain those. How about those shoes? Yep, we got to look at the shoes. If you're if you're convinced that your shoe works for you, then we need to make sure that that's the case. Many people get into shoes that are not proper for them. Either the toe box is not uh, wide enough, or the the hind foot or the rear foot it doesn't stabilize well or maybe there's too much lift in the shoe, or sometimes maybe the person is convinced that they need a minimalist shoe, a shoe that's completely flat, what we call it a neutral drop. Well, a lot of times we go from a normal shoe that might have 11 millimeters of lift in the back to something that's completely flat. And although we have good intentions, it can cause problems. So we gotta make sure that the shoe works for you. And ultimately people ask, hey, doc, do I need orthotic support? And my answer is maybe. Why do I say maybe? Because it doesn't make sense to just go to the orthotic until we have resolved all of these. Because if all you do is put a lift or an orthotic in a shoe and have unresolved structural issues, you're going to reinforce that problem. The person may feel better for a short amount of time, but what you'll see is this is the person that thinks that they need to get a new pair of orthotics like every six months because you know what? The, the pain comes back. So orthotics can be important, but we want to make sure that they are necessary. I put this slide in because almost always people want to know about what they can do to control the inflammation and changes in body chemistry that cause pain. And let's be honest, everything that takes place in the in the body is is 
impacted by inflammation. So yes, there's things that you can do to help to in, improve the inflammation, which will de decrease your pain. You still want to correct the mechanics, but certainly we want to do things to, to reduce the inflammation and make people feel better. Well, if the person's diet is so poor and they're eating all these acidic type foods and, and we can check their pH, um, and they, they're acidic, maybe they're a 5.6, where they should be about a 6.8, then we want to shift them to more plants-based diet and less grains and less meats. Or maybe we want to add in buffering type minerals. As we become acidic, we need to quench that acidity by using buffering minerals. So magnesium, calcium, potassium are the common ones that the body would use. And guess where we get those from? Well, we're going to steal them from connective tissue. And guess which connective tissue we're going to steal them from? We're typically going to steal it from the ones that are already irritated and inflamed. So that just makes the plantar fascia weaker or the, the you know, any of the other connective tissue weaker. So acid-based balance, very important for, for uh, improving, uh, you know, body chemistry and certainly important for, you know, the pain syndromes that we see. If a person has a true diabetic neuropathy, then absolutely we need to get the glucose, and the A1C under con under control. So things you can do coming out of the gate, if it's white, don't eat it. That means sugar, flour, pasta, rice, potatoes, you know, all the tasty stuff. I mean, I like that as well, but if you can't control your blood sugar, you gotta take these out of the diet because you're just gonna be pushing the pedal even harder and that's gonna cause your body to spiral out of control. The longer that the blood sugar is elevated, the, the greater likelihood that that blood sugar is going to start to gunk up sensitive tissues like the nerves, kidneys, the eyes. So we want to keep that in check. And there's some nutrients that we can add in that can help with that. I like chromium, vanadium, something called alpha lipoic acid. They either help our body metabolize sugar or it helps us with our insulin response. So these are things that certainly can be helpful. You want to talk to your practitioner about that because they might not be applicable to every situation, but these are things that we can think of. If we know that we have chronic inflammation in the foot and maybe we have it throughout the whole body, so this is the person who has foot pain, ankle pain, they got a shoulder problem, well, they might truly have systemic inflammation and we can measure that with something called CRP. We can look for the gout, that's the uric acid, and there's another marker called homocysteine. There's others as well, but these are kind of the, the three biggies. If these are elevated, then there's nutrients that we can do to help reduce these. The omega-3 fats, the fish oils are excellent. Turmeric, we all are you know, aware of that now because you, know, you, you can't go anywhere without seeing a supplement to sell turmeric or curcumin. There's something called, called Boswellia that does a great job controlling inflammation. And I put down folate and B12 because folate and B12 have a lot to do with some of the conversion processes in inflammation, certainly within uric acid. Again, um, this is specific to your condition, something you want to talk to your, your practitioner about, but again, they can be very beneficial. And um, what if our problem is vascular nature? So, well, we want to improve the blood supply. So we can measure that by doing what's called a Doppler or a vascular study. So if, if a person has been having a neuropathy, we might want to send them for a Doppler to see if, in fact, it's, it's vascular, not diabetes, or it's not um, a tarsal tunnel syndrome. So if we do have a vascular insufficiency, and those people kind of know that they do because there's maybe a family history of of uh, varicose veins or, or those types of things. Then there's things like butcher's broom, horse chestnut, colonsonia. These are all help to establish better integrity of the, the blood vessel walls and, and kind of strengthen them. And we can also take nutrients to increase what's called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide helps to dilate the blood vessels too. So a combination of, of nutrients to stabilize the, the blood vessel and to expand it can be very beneficial. Again, something you want to re review with your doc to make sure that they are um, applicable to your situation. So in closing, we went through a lot of different concepts of mechanics of the foot, what goes wrong when those mechanics change, um, the pathologies that present itself, and the ways that we can unwind and, 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 fix, and fix the issue. On my next slide, um, there, there's an offer that I've always put in when I do a presentation. So for those people that are interested in coming in, getting a proper assessment of their foot, 
get that gait assessment. We're going to put you on the, the gait scan, look at the shoes, and possibly even look at blood work and other things. I encourage you to do that. So feel free to call the office at, at any time and take advantage of, of our special. If you want to contact me for just generalized questions, feel free to call the office. I'd be more than happy to answer your questions. Um, you can email me as, as well at h.browning at rosellcare.com. Um, I hope you all learned a lot today. I will be doing another presentation probably in about two more months. So I hope you tune in for that as well. And as I said earlier, please feel free to contact me or come in and see me. We'd like to get you to feel better.